Pittsburgh. U.S. Air 427, Pittsburgh. U.S. Air 427, Pittsburgh. U.S. Air 427, radar contact lost. Those words provide no answers, but that's what investigators hope to begin getting at today. Good afternoon, I'm Michelle Wright. At this hour, the National Transportation Safety Board hearings into the crash of U.S. Air Flight 427 are getting underway. Bob Mayo is live downtown at the Hilton. Bob. We're leading off with the first of nearly 30 witnesses will be heard from this week. They've linked two ballrooms here at the hotel to form a massive hearing room. Accommodations for up to 500 people to sit in and watch the proceedings. Everyone gathered here to try to determine why Flight 427 crashed. Days of inquiry by the National Transportation Safety Board are the public phase of an intense process that's been continuing for months. Dozens of people on the NTSB team are here, and so are representatives of the airline industry unions. Captain Paul McCartney chairs the Airline Pilot Association's own Accident Investigations Board. He says people should not expect revelations or breakthroughs here. What they're going to hear is what didn't cause the accident. That should be of some comfort. Unfortunately, what they are not going to hear this week is what did cause the accident. We just aren't that far along in the investigation yet. Families of the 132 people who died in the crash are also here, staking out their seats with photos of lost loved ones. Attorney John Gizmondi says they want the latest facts and to make their presence known. Uh, out of respect uh, for loved ones that they lost. I think also to some extent they're here for the same reasons I, I mentioned a moment ago. That is, they want to know whatever the NTSB knows at this point. So I think it's, it's for both reasons. And of course, the attorneys will be following these proceedings closely as well, looking for potential witnesses and clues in the federal lawsuit filed by the survivors of the families of those who died in the crash of that flight. Again, the testimony just getting underway here in the Hilton downtown, reporting live from the Hilton. Bob Mayo, Michelle, back to you. All right, thank you, Bob. WTA4 News will have live team coverage of the NTSB hearing tonight on our news beginning at 5 o'clock for you. But up first tonight, everyone, the crash of U.S. Air Flight 427. Hearings are underway in Pittsburgh, aimed at shedding light on a tragic mystery. What caused the plane to roll and plunge 6,000 feet in a fiery and fatal crash four months ago? Our team coverage begins with Alan Jennings live from the hearings at the Hilton. AJ. Sally, uh, lots of talk today, but nothing conclusive at all. Did they rule anything out? possibility of that. The highlight of the hearings, though, was the release today of a computer recreation of the plane's final moments and the transcript of the cockpit voice recorder kept secret up until now. 25 seconds before the crash, the pilot's desperate exclamations can be heard. The wings begin to shake. The cockpit alarm sounds. The plane rolls to the left and dives. According to the transcript, you hear three clicks. Then pilot Peter Germano says, geez. The plane rolls. Germano breathes heavily and says, whoa. Then you hear a thump, some clicking. Then Germano says, according to the transcript, hang on. The autopilot is disconnected as the plane rolls sharply to the left. Germano says hang on co-pilot Charles Emmett says oh then an expletive Germano says what the hell is this then two warnings go off and the recorded voice says traffic traffic referring to a small plane nearby a split second later Germano says oh god oh god Emmett another expletive Germano yells pull and Emmett who is flying the plane utters two more expletives in the final two seconds Emmett says god no and Germano screams. According to the transcript, there are no sounds of gunshots or an explosion. And FBI officials testified here today that there was no evidence of sabotage. Now, the Pittsburgh office of the FBI was involved uh, in December. They said that they uh, had examined evidence. They said they found uh, no evidence of a bomb or gunshots uh, in the airplane. They said they even checked for uh, evidence of a surface-to-air missile. They said they even went that far. They said they found no evidence of any of those three things. Also, uh, a NASA engineer said that Vortex was not a serious threat. It's possible that Flight 427 may have gone through some type of uh, uh, wind turbulence, but uh, not enough to cause any particular problems. So tomorrow, more technical talk on what might have caused Flight 427 to crash. Live at the Hilton, Alan Jennings, Sally and Scott, back to you. Alan, what do we expect tomorrow? 
Sally, we're going to hear some more talk probably from Boeing engineers. They're uh, scheduled to testify about Flight 427, the type of aircraft that it was, and they're going to be mostly technical talk. Uh, they're going to uh, talk to and give testimony to NTSB investigators as to what they think might have caused the crash. Pretty much that's what's going to be going on tomorrow. A lot of technical talk in the next several days, I'm you sure. Bet. Thanks very much, Alan. For the families of the victims of this air tragedy, these hearings do bring some hope. They do, Sally. Many of them were at the hearings today uh, looking to finally get some answers about what happened and why. Our Bob Mayo has their story. Because they feel what you're feeling, and they truly understand what you feel. So many people just don't. A lot of people just, after so many months, they've forgotten what we haven't, and we won't forget. Rose Rubino lost her daughter and son-in-law. She says that more than any testimony, any evidence, it's the bond with the other surviving family members which has drawn them together for this hearing. To put a, na a face to all the names that we have heard of the families of the victims and so forth, and it's, uh, it's, it's hard to listen to this, but we know, just felt we need to be, needed to be here. And, Actually, obviously, we're hoping for an answer. These surviving relatives say there are issues that other families can help them address that investigators cannot. But there's also a hundred other, 131 other families that have been affected also. And I guess we all want to find some support and some comfort in each other. And you are in touch with those people. There is a bond there now. Of course there is. Of course there is. There's a bond that uh, will never be broken. This man wears a badge which symbolizes the family support group. His wife died in the crash. It's people that you didn't know three months ago are part of your family now. It's like, you know, uh, it's nice to talk to somebody else that's going through the same things that we've uh, I'm going through, you know, and there's others that have gone through more of a tragedy than me, losing two or, you know, three people maybe. Maybe on a plane. And of course, the attorneys for the families are also here listening for clues and potential witnesses they may call in the family's federal lawsuit. Reporting live from the Hilton, I'm Bob Mayo. Scott? Uh, Bob, uh, obviously the families will be paying very close attention to what goes on over the next uh, days and weeks. Uh, will they actually participate in the hearings? Can they give testimony or ask questions? They have no formal role in the hearing, but they are a strong presence here. 100 seats set aside for them. A family group is meeting right now, a newly constituted Air Disaster Support League, Flight 427 Air Disaster Support League. They're in the process of planning a news conference for tomorrow to outline their objectives and perhaps be available to comment on what we've heard in this session so far. Back to you, Sally. All right, thanks very much, Bob. And as Bob indicated, lawyers uh, for the families are very much in attendance in the hearing room. They have pressed all along for more information. Well, I think the most thing we're looking for is to get full disclosure as to what the NTSB knows now. Uh, whatever information they've developed, uh, whatever preliminary conclusions they've come to, I think we want to know that now. Now, some attorneys have even asked for graphic photographs from the crash scene to be turned over to them. Hearings continue today in the crash of U.S. Air Flight 427. Good afternoon. I'm Ron Jay. And I'm Dela Cruz. Those expected to testify include a Boeing engineer, a hydraulic fluid expert, and a U.S. Air Vice President of Engineering and Maintenance. Our Bruce Pompiani is covering those hearings, and he joins us now live with the latest. Good afternoon, Bruce. Good afternoon, Ron and Della. Well, you know, the popular theory around here this week is that the jammed rudder is what caused 427 to crash, and now attempts are being made to link 427 to a very similar accident that happened in Colorado Springs back in 1991, and they never did determine a cause of that accident. This morning, another Boeing engineer talked about the power control units on 737 rudders, and he says in the weeks before the Colorado Springs accident, a United Airlines pilot experienced a jammed rudder during a pre-flight check. However, he says the power control units in uh, Colorado Springs and 427 appear to function normally. A Boeing spokesperson left open the possibility, though, of other factors. But an attorney for the families is skeptical of Boeing doing its own testing. We're uh, quite sure that the rudder played a role. We think that the wake vortex played a role. The question is, what caused these things to occur? What caused the rudder to go hard over? Uh, and that's where you get into the testimony and all of the other systems that have an effect on both flying the airplane and on the mechanical parts of the airplane. It's a little bit like the building inspector letting the contractor inspect his own house to see that it complies with the building code. 
because the building inspector doesn't have enough people to get out there. Well, that doesn't happen when you build a house, but in the aviation industry, to some extent, that sort of thing happens because the FAA uh, and the NTSB have limited resources. It's not their fault, but it's a fact of life. And that attorney has gone to court to force Boeing to hand over some confidential documents relating to the Colorado Springs crash. And if there is a link that is established and Boeing is somehow held responsible, then 132 lawsuits are waiting to be filed. We'll have more, of course, first at 5 and continue our live coverage on the Pittsburgh Cable News Channel. That's it for now, though. Ron and Della, back to you. Yeah, you know, Bruce, it would seem that from what that attorney said, that this these hearings might at least prompt some new laws that would make that inspection do, that be done by the government yeah he he wants to see an independent process he doesn't know how feasible that is but certainly that may be one of the things that comes out of this 427 investigation that's at least what he hopes Could there be a link between the fatal crash of u.s air flight 427 and a united airlines flight that crashed three years earlier well families of the crash victims think so it's one of the latest developments at the national transportation safety board hearings in pittsburgh and Bruce Pompiani joins us now with that story. Bruce? Well, David and Derry at the NTSB never did find the probable cause in that Colorado Springs accident. And today there's been a lot of talk about similarities between that accident and 427's crash. You know, the rudder was suspect back then, too, in 1991. That's why the families have gone to court to force Boeing to provide them with some answers. And the PCU uh, passed all tests except for one. Boeing engineer Paul Klein says the first reported problems with rudder power control units dates back to the days just before the 91 crash of United Airlines Flight 585 in Colorado Springs. Klein says it was a United pilot in Chicago who noticed during a pre-flight inspection that his rudder did not respond to its commands. However, he claims extensive testing of the power controls in 427 and the Colorado Springs jet showed no evidence of malfunction. The NTSB never determined probable cause in the Colorado Springs accident, but even Boeing executives suggest there might be a link with 427. We're uh, quite sure that the rudder played a role. We think that the wake vortex played a role. The question is, what caused these things to occur? What caused the rudder to go hard over? While Boeing is keeping its options open, the families of 427 crash victims have gone to U.S. District Court and secured confidential Boeing documents on the Colorado Springs accident. Attorney John Gismondi is the lead counsel for the likely class action suit to be filed by victim survivors. Boeing's talking about the rudder. You know, they're not committing themselves, obviously, that the rudder was a design problem as opposed to maybe a pilot problem. Uh, that isn't something that anybody's prepared to commit to at this point. Gismondi is unhappy with the NTSB investigation and the fact that Boeing, a potential party in a lawsuit, is conducting its own testing of the plane wreckage. It's a little bit like the building inspector letting the contractor inspect his own house to see that it complies with the building code. Now, the attorney says 132 lawsuits are waiting to be filed once they determine who is responsible for this crash. Obviously, the main theory this week is that the rudder is responsible, but they're not sure what apparently caused it to jam. So that's the story for now. The testimony, by the way, will continue, we're told, until 8 o'clock tonight, and we'll continue to bring you live coverage of that. Reporting live at the Hilton, I'm Bruce Pompiani. David and Darius, back to you. Well, Bruce, do you know what Boeing and the FAA did when they found out there was a problem with the rudder? Well, they did redesign the power control unit, Darius, after that incident, and they required these other airplanes, the 737s, to be retrofitted. 427 was not. However, they don't think that uh, 427 or the Colorado Springs accident and those planes, they had any problems with the power control unit. At least that's what Boeing found. All, All right, right, Bruce. Thanks. The city talked tonight of a possible link between the crash of U.S. Air Flight 427 and a United Airlines 737 crash three years earlier. The rudder is suspect in both of these airline accidents. The families of the crash victims want, of course, to know more. Bruce Pompiani covering the NTSB hearings in Pittsburgh all week, and he joins us live from the Hilton downtown. Bruce? Well, Chris, the families have now gotten court permission to look at confidential Boeing documents related to that crash in Colorado Springs. Now, the NTSB never did find a cause to that crash, but the rudder is probably suspect there as well. At least that's what Boeing says. Boeing engineer today testified the rudder power control on a 737 jammed days before the Colorado Springs crash in 1991. A design change was made, but 427 did not have the updated version. But there's no evidence that the power control malfunctioned on 427 or in Colorado Springs. 
But the lead counsel for the families is upset because Boeing does its own testing. Because, let's face it, the FAA and the NTSB have rather limited manpower, and they rely on uh, the airplane industry and the aviation companies uh, to do certain things for them. It's a little bit like the building inspector letting the contractor inspect his own house to see that it complies with the building code. The pieces of the puzzle are very similar to the pieces of the puzzle at Colorado Springs, and that is you have to do an awful lot of testing, get a lot of facts and data, and try to make the pieces fit together. So. Now, Boeing does admit that the rudder probably did play a role in the 427 crash, but they point out they do not think that it malfunctioned, so they're leaving their options open on that point, and that obviously is going to be a point of contention. Reporting live at the Hilton Hotel in downtown Pittsburgh, I'm Bruce Pompiani. Chris, back to you. Bruce, I don't exactly know how to phrase this, but I know a lot of the victims' families have been a little bit upset as far as the evidence. As far as U.S. Air is involved and its relationship with the victims' families, are they doing any soothing effort or what here? Well, you know, as a matter of fact, U.S. Air called the families in. They had a meeting with them just a little while ago, and the family members came away from that meeting upset because, first of all, they say they're upset with the memorial, which makes no mention of the fact that these 132 people died in a plane crash. They're also upset because U.S. Air still has not returned some of their personal effects. There's some there's a list they have of about 60 things in U.S. Air's possession that belong to these crash victims. The uh, families who are all staying at the Hilton wanted U.S. Air to bring them here, but they refused and said if they wanted them, they had to go to the airport. So it's a very tense situation right now. The National Transportation Safety Board wrapped up its week-long hearings this afternoon into the crash of U.S. Air Flight 427. They're still not sure what happened, but the chairman of the NTSB says he's leaving Pittsburgh more determined than ever to find out what happened. Bruce Pompiani has been covering the hearings all week, and Bruce joins us live now with the latest from downtown. Bruce? Well, Chris, the NTSB closed the hearings today, but they certainly are not closing the book on the 427 investigation. In fact, the board members say they welcome any new theories that might lead them to a probable cause. I now declare this hearing to be in recess indefinitely. After five days and 31 witnesses, the National Transportation Safety Board is heading back to Washington. After a week's worth of technical talk, Chairman Jim Hall plainly pointed at the rudder as the apparent culprit in the 427 crash, but he refused to close the door on other possible theories. The frustrating thing is, uh, you know, the question is, if the rudder moved, as some of the simulations indicate it may have moved, then did it move as a result of uh, a a pa an action of the flight crew, or did it move as a result uh, of some anomaly or some, uh, some problem with the rudder? Boeing washed its hands of any guilt in a statement released after the hearings. The company says, we have found no evidence in this investigation which demonstrates that any airplane system failures caused or contributed to this accident which led attorney John Gismondi, the lead counsel for the families, to this conclusion. What you come away thinking is you've got Boeing kind of saying, we didn't do anything wrong, and you've got U.S. Air saying, we didn't do anything wrong. Boeing's, Boeing suggesting maybe the pilot did something wrong. The probable cause, as determined by the NTSB, is still many months away. But each of the interested parties left with a laundry list of specific areas on which to focus their attention. The families of the crash victims, while sometimes skeptical of the process, place their faith in the NTSB. The main lesson out of this is if we can get the cause so that this same cause will never cause any other families this sorrow again. And Chris, after the hearing today, there was another confrontation between the families and U.S. Air over the personal effects of the crash victims. I'm told, though, by the family's attorney that they have reached a compromise and that on Monday, all of the personal effects will be available at RIDC Park in the Harmerville area. So that's how they have resolved that issue. Reporting live at the Hilton tonight, I'm Bruce Pompiani. Back to you. You've been reporting on that aspect all week. What makes RIDC Park a better place than bringing it to the Hilton? Well, I don't know if it's a better place. It's certainly where they have reached the compromise, Chris. The families wanted them to bring it down here, as you say. U.S. Air refused to do that, saying they could go to the airport. And U.S. Air says, well, there wouldn't be any privacy bringing the stuff here with all the media camped out all week. So. That's what they're going to do. And at 5.30 tonight, it's the beginning of a long legal battle for families of U.S. Air Flight 427 crash victims. Attorneys representing a group of families in U.S. Air and Boeing are meeting it this afternoon at the federal courthouse in downtown Pittsburgh. Bruce Pompiani joins us live now with the latest on that. Bruce? 
But well, David and Margaret, as you might imagine, this is a very complicated case. I counted 31 attorneys in the courtroom today representing the various parties. What they're trying to do, basically, is set a schedule for these proceedings. The very earliest trial date that they are talking about today is September of 1996, two years after this accident. But the U.S. Air has made it very clear it is willing to settle individual cases before then. The U.S. Air did not pay any of us a penny. Alice Grasso at a news conference last week, six days before she settled her negligence lawsuit against U.S. Air and Boeing for an estimated two and a half million dollars. She is the only family member of a 427 crash victim to be compensated for the loss of her husband. More than 30 other families are now gearing up for what promises to be a protracted court battle before U.S. District Judge William Standish. There are basically two phases to their court case. First, they have to prove who's at fault Second, they must determine what is fair compensation. Whatever the NTSB ultimately finds to be the cause of the crash technically has no bearing on any civil lawsuits. John Gismondi is the lead counsel on the plaintiff's steering committee. We kind of go down a, uh, uh, a parallel track, but our track is not contingent on what uh, the NTSB concludes because whatever they conclude is not binding on Boeing, U.S. Air, or any of the families for that matter. Gismondi has been preparing the victims' families for what he expects to be a hardball approach by U.S. Air and Boeing attorneys who will try to convince a jury to return minimal damage awards. Anytime you get involved in litigation, sure, uh, both sides are going to look out for what's in their own best interest. They do what's in their best interest to protect the bottom line from the company's standpoint. Now, U.S. Air's lead attorney, Mark Dombroff, is uh, clearly taking what uh, many say is a hardball stance in court. He fought nearly every issue that was brought up today, and he refused to comment afterwards to us. Reporting live downtown, I'm Bruce Pompiani. David and Margaret, back to you. Families thought the memorial was simply too generic. As to item number one, would the memorial that exists now in Sewickley be changed to reflect the fact that the victims died in U.S. Air Flight 427? The answer basically to the families is, if, that would, if that's what you want, uh, U.S. Air uh, is willing to do it. As for the second request, the families wanted U.S. Air to purchase the crash site in Hopewell Township and build a memorial there. U.S. Air said after, after careful consideration, it would not purchase the land. Most were overcome by grief. It was last October, the first time the public had a chance to see this monument to the crash victims of U.S. Air Flight 427. The monument stands in Sewickley Cemetery, atop a grave that contains unidentified remains of crash victims. The names of the other victims engraved on either side. But there is nothing here to indicate how they died. John Gizmani represents some of the victims' families. I think to create the most dignified and the most respectful memorial that you can, uh, you should include a reference to how these people died. And now U.S. Air finally agrees. Gizmani says the airline will change the monument to indicate how these victims died. A victory of sorts for the victims' families, but at the same time a defeat. Family members wanted U.S. Air to purchase the 15-acre crash site in Hopewell Township for another memorial. John Gismani says U.S. Air has declined. U.S. Air's answer in that regard doesn't surprise me. And he says the families he represents aren't surprised either. They know how difficult it would be for U.S. Air to purchase the crash site. They're just glad, he says, that U.S. Air has decided to change its current monument to more accurately honor the memories of those who died. Gina Redman, WTAE, 4 News. U.S. Air hasn't decided yet exactly how they will change the cemetery memorial to reflect the way the crash victims died. A spokeswoman for the airline says they are taking ideas from family members. But of course, for those family members, the big question still really goes unanswered. Yes, Scott, they still don't know exactly what caused the crash of Flight 427. And federal investigators tell us tonight that we probably won't know for a couple of more months. They tell us they won't have a final report until sometime this summer. They say that's not that unusual, since a crash investigation can sometimes take between 9 and 12 months. One thing we do know is that investigators have focused on the plane's rudder for possible malfunction. New developments tonight surrounding the crash of U.S. Air Flight 427. They come in the form of a request from the victim's family members. Reporter Michelle Estevan is live in downtown Pittsburgh where the announcement took place. Michelle? 
Well, a victory of sorts today for the families of the victims of Flight 427. U.S. Air says it will grant their request to erect a monument in the memory of the crash victims. Now, you may remember the victims were buried in Swickley Cemetery after the September crash, but nowhere at the graveside and nowhere on the memorial wall there does it mention the crash of U.S. Air 427. Well, that will now change, according to the attorney for the families. Uh, after the families made a request, uh, U.S. Air has now agreed to erect a plaque noting the airline crash. The families also requested that U.S. Air buy the crash site land in Hopewell and make it a second memorial, but U.S. Air has denied that request. I'm sure there are some who are disappointed. There may be some who uh, perhaps had less of an interest in that area being memorialized. I don't know. I will say this. I'm not entirely surprised by U.S. Air's answer on the crash site. Now, there is no timetable at this point as for when that memorial will be modified in Sewickley Cemetery, but we do know that all the loved ones of those crash victims will be notified by mail. You wonder what, what exactly is going on. 132 lives lost two years of tears, and the families of Flight 427's crash victims are still searching for answers. And tonight, some of those families are wondering if 427 has really become the forgotten flight. And they're concerned about the effectiveness of an overworked agency, the National Transportation Safety Board. Channel 11's Bruce Pompiani is live at Pittsburgh International Airport with that story. Bruce. Well, the NTSB is a relatively small government agency with huge responsibility, and it simply doesn't have the manpower to find the causes of so many crashes. Headlines about the crash of U.S. Air Flight 427 have faded like the flowers at this monument in the Sewickley Cemetery. But the memories of lost loved ones are still fresh in the minds of the families of the 132 victims. Our crash was the only crash for a while. And then it seemed like they had the time to work on it or the updates or the, you know, the meetings or briefings or whatever. And then, but a new crash comes up and then another one and, and it just, it takes everything away. Two years of grieving has grown into frustration, still not knowing what caused the 737 to fall from the sky and shatter into pieces on this Hopewell hillside. At the time, investigators for the National Transportation Safety Board vowed to find the cause of the 427 crash before any other planes fell from the sky. Well, there have been nearly a dozen disasters since 427, and the NTSB is no closer to finding out what happened in Hopewell. And now, with the TWA explosion, the value jet crash in the Florida Everglades, and the Delta disaster in Pensacola, the NTSB admits 427 is on the back burner. Instead of the undivided attention it once got, NTSB spokesperson Alan Pollock tells me investigators on 427 now may only get a few hours a day, if that. It is frustrating to know that uh, man hours are being pulled away from this when... Um, there is a possibility that it could be solved. Those crashes have to be investigated, but um, to have such a small agency being stretched so thin, that's something has to be done about that. Lack of an official cause of the crash is also delaying court cases the families have filed against the airline and the plane's manufacturer. Am I surprised that uh, two years down the road we still haven't solved the crash? Uh, absolutely. Well, they may never know what happened. Uh, investigators say 427 is one of the most difficult cases they have ever encountered. And of course, as they have been saying all along, the flight data recorders on the 737 simply don't provide enough information. That's the story tonight from Pittsburgh International reporting live, Bruce Pompiani, Channel 11 News. All right, Bruce, thank you. Investigators do know, however, the rudder on 427 was in the wrong position, but they can't figure out if it was the result of a malfunction or a mistake. Well, those who have spent years now investigating it pretty much agree that a sharp swing of the rudder caused Flight 427 to crash in Hopewell Township. But that's as far as any agreement goes. New at 530, what people do not agree on is just what caused that rudder swing. And the families of those killed in the crash are caught in the middle. We have an update on the investigation from Stu Emery at News Desk 2. Stu? Yes, Jen. Well, Boeing, the plane's manufacturer, says, yeah, no question that it was an abrupt swing of that rudder that caused the plane to go down. But it says it could have not could not have been a me mechanical malfunction and says it could have been human error. Well, U.S. Airways and the Pilots Association says they don't agree with Boeing. They say it could not have been pilot error. 
After three years of painstaking investigation and examination of every recoverable piece of the 737, everything points to a sudden rudder swing, but no conclusive evidence of mechanical failure. Boeing suggests a situation where the flight crew was responsible for the rudder movement, but admits it can't prove it. U.S. Airways says such a scenario is inconceivable and says there's no flight condition that would cause a pilot to make and hold such an extreme rudder position. John Gizmondi is on the lead counsel team appointed by federal court to determine why the plane went down. My reaction to Boeing is that Boeing's kind of swimming upstream and the current's pretty strong. Uh, you know, everybody else seems to be pointing to a malfunction in the, uh, in the rudder, and now they seem to be suggesting, well, we don't think a malfunction can occur, but we can't prove it. Gizmondi says that any hypothesis about what the flight crew did or did not do is just that, speculation. And he says regardless of where the blame lies, the victims' families have legal recourse. I, I think the families, as far as the litigation is concerned, will have what they need. It's just a question of whether or not that evidence points more strongly to U.S. Airways or to Boeing. But we know it wasn't the passenger's fault. Now, Boeing will be making its findings under oath in federal court within just a few weeks, and the National Transportation Safety Board, they'll be completing its investigation by the end of the year. Jen? Will the families of those killed in the crash of U.S. Air Flight 427 have access to the cockpit voice recorder tapes? Or will they have to rely on written transcripts of the tapes for their federal court suit? That is what a federal judge is deciding after hearing arguments from family attorneys, U.S. Airways, Boeing, and the Airline Pilots Association. The airline, the manufacturer, and the Pilots Association all argue that the tapes should not be released because the transcripts and the researchers who prepared the transcripts are available for study. But the attorneys for the families disagree. Well, the transcript is just type, typing. There's no sound on the transcript. We think the sounds are important. The NTSB has spent hundreds of man hours listening to sounds. They obviously believe the sounds contain some clues. We want to hear the same clues that Boeing's heard, that U.S. Air has heard, and the NTSB's heard. Judge William Standish says he will decide in the near future. Harold Hayes will have more on the arguments in this case coming up at 6 o'clock. Can sounds mean more than words? The attorneys for families who lost loved ones in the crash of U.S. Air Flight 427 think so. So they've asked a federal judge to release the cockpit voice recorder tapes that capture the last moments before that crash. Harold Hayes has our report. Uh, I've said everything I have to say in court. Thank you very much. What the attorneys for U.S. Airways and Boeing and the Airline Pilots Association argued in court was that the cockpit voice recorder tapes from Flight 427 should not be turned over to attorneys for the victims' families. They argue that the transcripts and the people who prepared the transcripts during the National Transportation Safety Board investigation are available to the lawyers who are preparing their liability case against the airline and the plane's manufacturers. The Airline Pilots Association argued that the painful last sounds of the crew should never be revealed for the sake of their privacy. In the moments before the crash, the transcript indicates a clicking noise, and then the captain says, hang on. There is a grunting noise from the pilot, and then the noises of the plane stalling, according to the transcript. Then the pilot says, oh, and an expletive, and the captain says, oh, God, oh, God. That's at about 7.03 p.m. on September 8, 1994. In the next seconds, the plane crashed in the woods in Hopewell Township, Beaver County. But the attorneys for the family say the transcript is not enough, since the airline has heard the tape during the safety board investigation. Transcript uh, deliberately deletes certain information. Uh, some of the information under the transcript is actually a, a result of the consensus of the people listening to it as to what certain sounds mean. Um, they all have interest in the litigation, which are different from ours. We want to listen to the same sounds and determine if we hear the same thing. The judge says he will rule soon on this issue, but this case isn't expected to get to trial for another year. Harold Hayes, KDK TV News. At this point, the only issue for the judge to consider is whether the tapes would be turned over to the attorneys of the, families vict of the victims' families. The attorneys have not asked for the tapes to be made public. 
Relatives of the victims of U.S. Air Flight 427 will have to wait. A judge has delayed his decision about whether to release the pub to the public the cockpit recordings of the final moments of that flight. I, I indicated to the judge what we thought. Thank Did you. you just repeat that? Uh, no, thank you very much. Attorneys from U.S. Airways, Boeing, and the Airplane Owners and Pilots Association had no comment as they left federal court. They argued to federal judge William Standish that the cockpit tape should not be released. They contend releasing the tapes would violate what amounts to workplace privacy laws of the pilot and crew. That releasing the tapes would not give liability lawyers information they don't already have. And that lawyers for the relatives of those who died don't need voices for a fair trial. One lawyer said, quote, Voices will do nothing but raise speculation. Attorney John Gismonti says a transcript alone is not enough. Because the transcripts don't contain sounds. The transcripts only contain spoken words. They don't contain some of the mechanical thumps and clicks and other sounds that the NTSB obviously thinks are important. Attorney Jerry Skinner says the wheels of justice are moving painfully slow on this case. Relatives have already had to wait more than three um, years. It means that as of today, they still have no further information than they did yesterday about uh, what Boeing and U.S. Air say caused this accident. And they do have opinions, and I think the families are entitled to know what those Maybe opinions are. Only one person at that hearing has heard the tape. The judge hearing the case, Judge Standish, conceded today he isn't expert enough to interpret the sounds on the tape. He's expected to make a ruling within a few weeks. Tonight, more than two dozen families fight to get voice recordings from the ill-fated Ill U.S. Air Flight 427. The families want those tapes to prove their loved ones were terrorized by the impending crash in Hopewell Township. Channel 11 Stuart Brown is live in downtown Pittsburgh with continuing coverage. Stu? Peggy, after a one-hour court session here, federal judge William Standish says he'll decide soon whether lawyers for the families of crash victims can gain access to those tapes. I expect we're at least another year away. Lawyers for 25 families of Flight 427 passengers emerged from yet another federal court hearing saying a trial of their combined lawsuit may not take place till late next year. The delay at least partly because of the legal dispute over the audio tapes found in the cockpit voice recorder. Only an edited transcript has been made public. But federal investigators and representatives of U.S. Airways and Boeing, the plane's manufacturer, have heard the tapes. They obviously believe the sounds contain some clues. We want to hear the same clues that Boeing's heard, that U.S. Air has heard, and the NTSB's heard. The tapes contain conversations between pilots, air traffic controllers, the flight crew, and sounds in the cockpit. Sir, Lawyers for the airline, the Boeing, and the Pilots Association really say the tapes are say. irrelevant and give privacy rights as a reason not to release them. Survivors' lawyers disagree. Some of the information under the transcript is actually a, a result of the consensus of the people listening to it as to what certain sounds mean. Um, they all have interests in the litigation which are different from ours. We want to listen to the same sounds and determine if we hear the same thing. Now, the National Transportation Safety Board is expected to come up with a probable cause of that crash in the next few months. Live in downtown Pittsburgh, Stuart Brown, Channel 11 News. Thank no decision tonight on whether the families of the victims of U.S. Air Flight 427 will be able to hear the cockpit voice tapes. They're asking a federal judge to release the tapes. The family's attorneys argue it's important to be able to listen to the tapes. If we think the sounds are important, the NTSB has spent hundreds of man hours listening to sounds. They obviously believe the sounds contain some clues. We want to hear the same clues that Boeing's heard, that U.S. Air has heard, and the NTSB's heard. Attorneys for the airline and Boeing say there is no need to release the tapes. They contend all of the information is already available in written transcripts. Victory of sorts tonight for the families of victims of U.S. Air Flight 427. A federal court judge here in Pittsburgh ruled the attorneys for the families can hear the cockpit voice recorder tapes that already have been made available to U.S. Airways and Boeing. In previous testimony, both the airline and the airplane maker have said the tapes will not provide any worthwhile clues. At the same time they were saying that, they were submitting extensive written documents to the NTSB telling them there were vital clues in those sound bits. First to 530, big story. Almost three years too much to the day after the crash of U.S. Air Flight 427, a major development. 
A Pittsburgh federal judge has decided to allow the release of a copy of the cockpit voice recorder to the lawyers of the families of the victims with stipulations. Andy Pearson has been covering the story. He has more, Andy. Well, Scott, Judge William Standish says lawyers for the family can have the audio tape, but the screams and some of the sounds the pilots made have to be cut out. Now, that's a partial victory, a partial defeat for the lawyers of these families who are trying to decide who's at fault. The legal fighting between U.S. Air, now U.S. Airways, Boeing, the maker of the 737, and the families of the 132 people who died in the crash has gone on more than two years. Up to this point, U.S. Airways and Boeing have been able to listen and analyze the cockpit voice recordings for their own lawsuits. Lawyers for the families have not. Judge William Standish's ruling changes that, saying it seems patently unfair not to allow counsel for the plaintiffs or the families to hear the CVR tape and to have the tape analyzed by their own experts. A victory of sorts for the team of seven lawyers fighting for the families who haven't already settled with U.S. Airways. We're happy with this ruling. It allows the plaintiffs an opportunity to have their experts review the tape and learn what we can about uh, the pilot's reactions. Victims' lawyers may have been given a setback, though, when the judge ruled the screams and expletives of the pilots cannot be used. Standish says the court concludes that the privacy rights of the pilots of U.S. Air Flight 427 clearly outweigh the plaintiff's right to hear these statements or sounds. That's something attorney John Gizmondi says he would have liked his experts to hear. And he concluded that there's, there are no clues in the screams themselves and they don't have any reflection on what the passengers were experiencing. But now your experts won't have a chance to dispute that. That's correct. By the way, you will never hear those recordings on TV or radio. Just three months before the U.S. air crash, Congress passed a law that said the CVR tape can never be played for the public, only for the lawyers and their experts involved in any type of case like this. By the way, a U.S. Airways spokesman tells me they will comply with today's order. Reporting in the newsroom, Andy Pearson, Channel 4 Action News. Okay, Andy, thank you. Investigators looking into the crash of U.S. Air Flight 427 will miss yet another deadline. The NTSB had been expected to release its report on the probable cause of the crash this fall, but now that probably won't happen until sometime early next year. Bruce Pompiani is here now with the latest there. Bruce? Well, Jen, you know it's already the longest investigation of a plane crash in U.S. history, and now it's about to get even longer. 427 crashed four years ago in Hopewell Township. Investigators believe the plane's rudder turned sharply to one side, sending that plane into an uncontrollable nosedive. And investigators can't say for sure if it was a mechanical malfunction or pilot error at this point. Families were told to expect an answer November 17th, but now they have to wait again. Well, it does kind of hang over your head a little bit. Um, you would like to see it cleared up, um, something definite uh, come out and get some positive results that will uh, help the air safety cause. What I read into, it's got to be one of two things. Either they're busy on other crashes or they feel like they've got more homework to do probably on the rudder. I'd like to think it's the latter. 132 people died in the crash and the continuous delays by the NTSB in issuing this report, Jennifer, has also slowed down the litigation, the lawsuits filed by the crash victims' families as they sue U.S. Air and Boeing. Reporting in the newsroom, Bruce Pompiani, KDKA TV News. Families who lost loved ones in the crash of U.S. Air Flight 427 will have to wait even longer now to hear answers from investigators. The National Transportation Safety Board has once again delayed its final report on the cause of the crash that happened in Hopewell Township. Bruce Pompiani is here now with the latest. Bruce? Well, Stacy, those families were told to expect the report November 17th, but now they've been told to wait again until early next year. 427 crashed four years ago in Hopewell Township. Investigators suspect a malfunction in the plane's rudder. The problem is proving it and ruling out pilot error. Families of the 132 crash victims say they hope the report will bring closure, but all the waiting has been very frustrating. Well, it does kind of hang over your head a little bit. Um, you would like to see it cleared up, um, something definite uh, come out and get some positive results that will uh, help the air safety cause. What I read into, it's got to be one of two things. Either they're busy on other crashes or they feel like they've got more homework to do probably on the rudder. I'd like to think it's the latter. 427 is already the longest investigation of a plane crash in U.S. history and unfortunately it's about to get even longer. Bruce Pompiani, KDKA TV News. Michael. 
Sally. Now joining us live from our newsroom is attorney John Gizmondi, who represents a lot of the families of the victims in a civil suit. Mr. Gizmondi, have you seen the report or a draft of it, or have any of the families seen it? No, we haven't seen the actual draft, Sally, but we've uh, obviously heard the reports about the, uh, the conclusions in the draft. Uh, the, the report itself, of course, goes before the full board in about 10 days on March 23rd. You plan to be there, of course. Yeah, we sure do. Now, can you tell me, how is this going to affect your suit against U.S. Air and Boeing? Well, I, I think that generally what it does, it certainly focuses more attention on Boeing to the extent the NTSB concludes that the rudder was the cause of the accident as opposed to the pilot doing some, something incorrect. Uh, obviously, if the pilot did something incorrect, that would be U.S. Air's fault. But if it's a problem with the rudder, that's generally Boeing's fault. And the report seems to focus primarily on the rudder. Now, you have been pointing, you and, and your clients and, and uh, a lot of people investigating this have been pointing at a design problem with the rudder for a long time. This has got to be frustrating for you for it to have taken this long. Yeah, it is, Sally, the, uh, certainly the longest investigated air crash in U.S. aviation history. And it's been frustrating because the final hearing that supposedly is going to take place in 10 days has been put off so many times in the past. But I think the conclusion that they're going to reach there is a conclusion that confirms what we've been saying for the last few years, which is that the rudder is the culprit. All right. Thanks very much. John Gizmondi representing a lot of the families of the victims in that civil suit. From the very beginning, all eyes have focused on the rudder of the Boeing 737. USA Today is reporting that the NTSB will in fact conclude that 737s have a severe rudder problem. Victims, uh, families of the victims, that is, uh, are very anxious to hear these findings. There's certainly nothing that's in the way of consolation that you can offer to people who have gone through, you know, the, the, a human tragedy of the depth that they have. But I think at least, you know, they would like to th think that the official agency investigating this has come to some conclusion. John Shumway joins me now. John, of course, we all want to know what happened to Flight 427, but, but no one more so than the families of the victims on that plane. And they have stayed very di diligent through the whole investigation, watching closely this investigation, making sure that no one lost track of the human victims, the 132 people who died on Flight 427. A large section of this room has been set up for those family members. I'm told as many as 85 of the victims could be represented by family members here tomorrow. And for many, it is part of the grieving process and Jen coming up uh, about 5:30 or so we'll be back to talk more about that process which has gone on incredibly long because of this prolonged investigation all right thanks very much John we'll see you again then almost five years ago US Air Flight 427 fell from the sky today victims families are still searching for closure Good evening, I'm Sheila Hyland. And I'm Jay Harris. John is off tonight. Tomorrow could mark the end of the longest and most costly disaster investigation in aviation history. U.S. Air Flight 427 crashed in Hopewell Township, killing all 132 people on board. Tomorrow in Springfield, Virginia, the NTSB will hold a public meeting to issue their final report on the crash. Katie Sesney joins us now live from Washington, D.C. Katie? That's right. At 9.30 tomorrow morning, the Hilton Hotel in Springfield, Virginia, will set the stage for the long-awaited conclusion to what caused Flight 427 to crash back in 1994. But even a conclusion may be far from closure for the families of the 132 people who died when Flight 427 went down. The rubble has been cleared from this Beaver County field for five years now. But for many, it's as though U.S. Air Flight 427 from Chicago to Pittsburgh crashed here just yesterday. I walked her out to the car and said goodbye, and, and I just never saw her again. Forty years old, Janet Stamos was just one of 132 people who died. And her husband, John, is among many who hope to discover why when the NTSB concludes their findings tomorrow morning. Uh, a lot of the families, I, I think, feel that they, they want to have an answer something they can pinpoint but you know I'm not really sure that's gonna happen attorney John Gizmondi represents the families of the victims he's more optimistic everybody certainly expects that their conclusion is gonna be that there was a problem uh, with the rudder exactly what that problem is is probably what we're most interested in perhaps a difficult request in light of an investigation with no survivors and few clues the conclusion's only as good as the information you have to sift through. And certainly, 
they are at somewhat of a handicap compared to information that they've had on other crashes. But it's the lack of information that keeps Kretz busy, pushing airline safety to the forefront for public awareness. It makes you feel that you're doing the right thing by keeping the pressure on the airlines to, uh, and the FAA to correct these things. But mechanical fixes are only a surface solution for those who are dealing with matters of the heart. She was basically my whole life. I mean, we just, uh, it was her and I. Um, we did uh, everything together. A bond so strong that even a conclusion won't ensure closure. It's never going to be the end. I mean, it, this is your life. It's not the end until it's the end of your life. Um, you know, it's always going to be there. And no matter what. Now, approximately 100 family members have arrived for tomorrow's hearing, including John Kretz, who we spoke with earlier. He tells us that he's somewhat excited about the outcome. What can be expected tomorrow? Well, investigators will present their findings to the safety board, at which time changes will most likely be made to the probable cause and the safety recommendations. Now, the board will then vote on those findings. The NTSB is hoping to wrap things up tomorrow, but the hearing could go through Wednesday. Jay, Sheila. Katie Sesney. Live in Washington, D.C. tonight. We would like to hear more answers. Thank yes, you, you, Katie. Show the final seconds of Flight 427. Now, while the NTSB, as I say, hasn't released, issued its findings yet, uh, we have heard from them that they do believe the rudder was the cause of the crash, and they are ruling out pilot error. It is a highly technical, finely detailed line. presentation about what happened to Flight 427, and there is little doubt about the eventual conclusion. Early in the investigation, it became apparent that the rudder deflected fully to the left. The focus of the investigation has been to determine the events that could have resulted in that rudder movement. Using dramatic computer graphics, the NTSB simulated the final moments of Flight 427. It was such a powerful display that family members were warned that they may not want to view it. The text of the cockpit conversation was displayed as the plane made a hard left and then nosedived to the ground 5,000 feet below. An animated cockpit gave even more perspective, and according to the NTSB, rules out pilot error. A significant development for John Gizmondi, the lead attorney who represents Flight 427 families. They've pretty much uh, said that the evidence was overwhelming from their standpoint that the rudder reversal didn't come from any human error. Uh, so that's got to be good news for, uh, for U.S. Air. Gizmondi says good news for U.S. Air because U.S. Air and Boeing, the manufacturer of the plane, have been arguing over the past several years as to whether this was a mechanical failure or a pilot error. Pretty clear now that it, it looks like they're going to conclude it was a mechanical error. A lot more on this story coming up throughout the evening. I'm Paul Martino, live in Springfield, Virginia. All right, Paul, thank you. Good evening. Government investigators released their findings today about the crash of U.S. Air Flight 427. For more than four years, there has been speculation that the plane experienced rudder problems, and today, that was confirmed. At a hearing in Springfield, Virginia, the National Transportation Safety Board announced that an uncommanded reversal of the rudder panel on the Boeing 737 may have caused the crash back in September of 1994. John Shumway and Paul Martino have our live home team coverage. We begin with Paul, who has details about today's announcements. Paul? Good evening, Patrice. The hearing just broke up after nearly eight hours of testimony today. We have not gotten the final list of findings. That will come tomorrow morning. But here's what we did get out of today's hearing. They are, in fact, blaming a mechanical failure in the rudder. Uh, they are also being critical of the FAA for not installing more sophisticated black boxes in 737s. National Transportation this Safety Board here. Chairman James Hall apologized for the long overdue findings in the Flight 427 investigation. And he took the FAA to task for not installing better flight data recorders in 737s. The complexity of this investigation, coupled with the appalling lack of flight data recorder information, has necessitated a long and comprehensive investigation. The NTSB is making a high-tech, all-too-real presentation of the final moments of Flight 427. The computer animation was difficult for some family members to watch, but it supports the NTSB conclusion that an uncommanded rudder movement caused the plane to make a hard left 
and then nosedive. Investigators blame a similar rudder problem for a fatal crash in Colorado Springs in 1991, as seen here in this animation, and a near crash in Richmond, Virginia in 1996. Same problem. And contrary to what Boeing, the manufacturer of the plane, has concluded, the NTSB has ruled out pilot error. Certainly, uh, they focused on the rudder reversal, and they seem to be concluding that it was something mechanical with the, uh, with the rudder itself. Now, the NTSB is also expressing some concern about the retrofitting of these uh, rudders that is underway now on all 737s. There is some question as to whether the changes being made go far enough. I'm Paul Martino, reporting live from Springfield, Virginia. Okay, thank you, Paul. of the longest investigation in NTSB history. The National Transportation Safety Board will release its four-year draft report on the crash of Flight 427. Sheldon Ingram reports families of the victims hope the hearing brings closure. John Crest is on his way to Springdale, Virginia, where the NTSB will give its final report on the crash of Flight 427. Crest says he thinks about the painful event every day. His wife, Janet, died in the crash. Something I'll never get over. Uh, it's just, it makes things very empty. Kretz believes the FAA should mandate an upgrade on all flight data recorders, known as the black box. An upgrade could help investigations like the one on Flight 427, which has now surpassed four and a half years. You know, how can you find the cause of something if, if you don't have any information to work on? John Gismondi is one of the seven attorneys appointed to represent the 129 families on why the plane crashed. One of the hindrances in flight 427 was the fact that that plane had a relatively old black box that only collected very very little information since the crash of 427 the faa required all 737 100 to 500 models be retrofitted with new rudder systems nearly half the planes have been upgraded but that doesn't erase the greatest loss in kretz's life oh that's been something that's been very hard to overcome. There are still 10 to 15 families that have not settled with U.S. Air or Boeing, so the details that will come out of the NTSB hearing over the next two days will be vital to their interests should their cases end up in court. Sheldon Ingram, Channel 4 Action News. That is our big story tonight at 6. The longest NTSB investigation in history comes to an end tomorrow when the board releases its final report on the 1994 crash. Our Sheldon Ingram takes a look at what we may see in that report. John Kretz's wife, Janet, died in the crash of Flight 427. This is what he remembers about his last conversation with his wife of just four years. She called the, the, that night about 6 o'clock to tell me she was taking an earlier flight. And I just said, well, uh, be careful. I'll see you at, at uh, 7. And... and it. A lot of emphasis has been placed on the rudder system as to the cause of the crash. Investigators say it switched sharply to the left 6,000 feet in the air. But why it shifted left is what investigators have yet to determine after four years. John Gismondi is one of seven attorneys appointed to represent the 129 families as to why the plane crashed. He says investigators must determine if it was pilot error or mechanical error. Boeing has suggested that the pilots must have done something improper to cause the rudder to go over to the left. And U.S. Air, of course, is saying that uh, the pilots didn't do anything wrong, that the rudder made what's known as an uncommanded movement to the left. I hope for a definitive answer, but I don't really feel that we're going to get one. If the NTSB comes back and pinpoints cause, uh, it'll be a significant breakthrough on this problem. The NTSB hearing is expected to last all of two days, but after four years of fact-finding, many observers believe the board still will not have a definitive answer as to what caused the crash of Flight 427. Sheldon Ingram, Channel 4 Action News. Since the crash of 427, the FAA has ordered new rudder systems for Boeing 737-100 to 500 models. Keep it on Channel 4. Starting tomorrow at 5, Sheldon will have live reports from Springfield, Virginia on the NTSB's report. Joining me now is John Gismondi, who's an attorney. You're one of seven attorneys appointed to represent the families and to why uh, 427 went down. 
What did you get out of the hearing so far today, John? Well, I think so far, it's certainly the focus has been on the rudder, and the conclusion I think that they're reaching is that the rudder went hard over to the left because of some malfunction as opposed to something that the pilot did. Uh, that's one of the main conclusions I think that they've offered uh, today. The other big thing I think is their frustration, the NTSB's frustration, over the foot dragging that they perceive the FAA uh, engaging in, in getting these more sophisticated black boxes, as you mentioned in the intro. I mean, the bottom line is you can't prevent future accidents unless you can solve the old ones. And you can't solve accidents unless you have the clues that the black box provides. I think Jim Hall, the chairman of the NTSB, is frustrated because these planes have the old, outdated black boxes that don't give you the clues. He wants better black boxes. It's like a doctor who says, I need better equipment. I can save patients, but we don't have them. John Gismondi, thank you very much for joining us. We expect it to be here again tomorrow for the hearing, as is expected to go for about another hour tonight. Reporting live from Springfield, Virginia, Sheldon Ingram, Channel 4 Action News. Thank you, Sheldon. Mike?